Hey everyone, this is Ole Sharanki from Laddering Your Success, and you're listening to the LYS Podcast. All right. Afternoon, everyone. How y'all doing today? Good afternoon. Good. Just wanted to say thank you again for joining us for another in-person said podcast here at LYS Podcast here at the said Institute. My name is Ole. This is Festus. <laughs> but let me go ahead and just do a brief intro. I think this is our fifth, sixth, sixth, sixth. Uh, six in person event and it's been really really awesome to see it grow and to have people from all different backgrounds come and talk about just their input to society what they're doing to make this this community better and of course the wider goal of just bringing this energy to the west side as a councilwoman Tiffany Thomas says she want to make the west side the best side so there's so many resources there's so much great things happening here we just want to continue to let that light be shown in this area so we talked a little bit about Dr. Olivia Hayes. Dr. Olivia Hayes serves as the Career Development Specialist for Government, Pre-Law, and Public Administration at the University of Houston. As a Career Development Specialist, she works with students through their major or career exploration, supports students to prepare strong application materials, teaches students strategies on how to have the confidence in their own skills and abilities, and provides individual recommendations based on student needs. She also serves as an instructor for the Liberal Arts Career Planning Course for Liberal Arts students. Dr. Hayes received her Bachelor of Arts in History with a minor in Political Science and her Master of Education in Curriculum Instruction from Prairie View A&M University. Shout out Panthers. <laughs> Furthermore, continuing her passion for helping students, she attended the University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas, where she received her Doctor of Education in Ethical Leadership. Her research focused on undergraduate, upperclassmen, black male STEM students, perceptions of academic advising at a historically black college or university and Hispanic serving institution in Southeast Texas. Olivia is a proud member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Inc., where she continues to exemplify excellence through sustainable service while giving back to her community and soaring in leadership. Dr. Hayes' passion is student success. She believes. It's not about how you start, it's how you finish. Something I believe we can all relate to. So please help me in giving a warm LIS welcome to Dr. Olivia Hayes. So Dr. Hayes, welcome, it's glad to have you on this episode of Edgy Steps or your episode of, of Edgy Steps live in person at the Said Institute. Thank you. So oftentimes we, we talk about education, we talk about higher education, and it seems like, hey, you know, you just get that degree and it's rainbows and sunshine. And we often don't talk about the struggle or the pathway to get that education. Could you share with us a little bit about your upbringing? You know, was, was it like, hey, you know, you, you got to go to college or was it like, uh, you know, a challenge or how was your upbringing and your, your pathway to higher education? Yes, no, thank you, and thank you for allowing me to share this space. I think that's a fun question. So I'm very authentic, so we're going to have a lot of fun. I'm very, I talk with my hands, I talk with my gestures, so we're going to have a lot of fun. But um, just a little bit about myself. I'm originally from Kansas City, Missouri. I'm not a Houstonian, but yeah. um, I, <laughs> but I am originally, but technically I am because I've been here almost 10 years. Oh, so. Okay. But um, I'm originally from Kansas City, Missouri. I grew up in a single parent household. I went to Raytown South High School. That is kind of when I grew up. I grew up kind of in the urban area, but we moved and that area kind of started to get gentrified. And so I grew up there and, you know, my senior year, kind of going into my junior year and my senior year of high school, I wanted to, you know, kind of really figure out what I wanted to do. And ultimately, it's funny that I'm sitting in a seat that now I'm helping students figure out what they want to do. But I was that one that didn't know what I wanted to do. And so when I was in high school, I really wanted to go to cosmetology school. That is very surprising. But I wanted to go to cosmetology school. I thought that it, that was fun. I also was a dancer. I grew up in the studio. I was on the dance team. I thought that I had a career ahead of me and competing and doing all of these things. But it took one injury for me to realize that that was not going to be a career for me. It really did. And then it also took my dad telling me that you're not going to really be successful in this career. Yes, you can make it a career, but I really encourage you to have a plan B. 
And so it wasn't until I got into my senior year that I was offered an opportunity to participate in the A-plus program. And the A-plus program was an opportunity that I was able to seek out volunteer. I went and volunteered at an elementary school. I helped students read. It was kind of fun. And so I had to get about 50 volunteer hours. Well, the I guess you could say the successful outcome of that would have been that they would have paid for me to go to college for two years free at a local community college in the state of Missouri. And so I took that opportunity and I was able to attend Longview Community College. I was able to attend that for two years, still literally just walking the campus, not knowing what I wanted to do. I was working at Lowe's. I was working at Lowe's and I was also going to school. And still in my mind, I was like, I still don't know what I wanted to do. But in high school, I had the opportunity to go to Votech, go to cosmetology, but I chose nursing. You see, I'm all over the place, y'all. Yeah, all over the place. Because I, even, I thought about going to be a doctor, which wow. I, I am now, yeah, but yeah. I wanted to be a medical doctor. Mm. Um, and so I had my pediatric, and I was like, oh, this seems cool, too. Like, you know, so I just kind of just was, and so when I was a senior in high school, I actually pursued nursing at the time where half of the day I went to nursing school and then half of the day I spent at my high school. And I thought that was something that I wanted to do, but it wasn't. And so I actually went to Longview and I just pursued whatever, like it was just, a, but it wasn't until I told myself that, okay, something has to change. I don't know what. But at that time, I just kind of was looking around and was just like, okay, this is it. Like, this is it. This is, this is Kansas City, Missouri. This is it. I don't know what's next for me. I don't know. I don't know. So guess what I did? I just started looking up colleges. I started having conversations with some of my friends that were leaving Kansas City. And I was like, where are y'all going? What are y'all doing? And the next thing I know, they're going to Prairie View. So I started talking and seeing friends that they were pursuing Prairie View. And I was like, well, let me see what this is. So the topic of attending an HBC became a discussion. And then from there, I took that step. Um, yes, I did have parents that pursued a degree, but they did not understand now in society, what, what do I need to do to help my student, or not student, but what do I need to do to help my kid get there? So it was a lot of things that I was doing on my own. I applied to college on my own. I didn't really know about financial aid, so I was doing crazy stuff. <laughs> because kind of crazy, stuff? crazy stuff in terms of, for example, you enter, and, I, and this will all play a part, but the financial literacy piece that goes into preparing your child for going to college in terms of sitting them down to help them understand, okay, you may not need to take out student loans or this is what this means in terms of your estimated need. Mm -hmm. This is how you break that down. I didn't have that. Mm -hmm. I was figuring it out all on my own. And so I came to Prairie View and the rest is history. Like, so, it is. So were you trying to flip your Pell Grant with you? I just, I mean, them student <laughs> refunds, I'm not gonna lie, the student <laughs> refunds were great. But in terms of, I just wish that, and even in high school, right, once again, this. We're gonna to talk today about some things, but I didn't have the career course or like the college counselor. I didn't have that in high school to where I could go and talk to someone about um, what even financial aid is or where to even go. I didn't have that. I didn't have anyone that was broadening my perspective in terms of the career piece and what I wanted to become. I didn't have that. So it was kind of me just figuring it out and I got to Prairie View. So can you tell us about the journey from Prairie View to St. Thomas and how did that come about? Yes, so Prairie View was an amazing time. I loved it. It was probably the pivotal point in my success in my career. And I'll get into that, but as it pertains to me leaving a state that I had never did anything like that before. Um, I left the state, I came to a new state, I started a new life and wanted to just pursue something different for myself. And Prairie View allowed me to do that. It allowed me to enhance who I was as a black woman. It allowed me to connect with other individuals that I was like, oh, okay, this is gonna be a great time. And so I partied, I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna throw that out of the experience because that's what comes with it. That yes, I had fun, I partied, but I was successful in it. And so it wasn't until a woman by the name of Dr. Joseph Rapper it was not until she came into my life in 2015 and gave me my first opportunity 
as a student worker. And that changed my life. And like I said, the rest is history. She was the director of the Student Academic Success Center. The key word is success. And she was the epitome of what I think in my eyes. I was like, wow. So this is what a black woman in leadership looks like at this level. And you're from the east side of St. Louis. So you're kind of where I'm from. Okay. We're, okay, cool. So I think for me, she gave me my first opportunity. Um, but the work that she did on that campus spoke for itself. She was the director and she started the Panther Pride Summer Bridge Program, which was a summer bridge program for incoming freshmen. And it was a five week program that allowed them to come to campus. Their tuition for the summer, their books, their room and board was paid for for free. They didn't have to pay for anything. So for me to get an opportunity like that to be put in a space to mentor, to lead, but also to be in a room with the president of Prairie View at the time. I'm, I'm in a room with VPs. I'm in a room with people that, like, wow, I don't deserve to be here, but I'm here. But thank you, you're putting me in these rooms. But it wasn't just that, she kept me on her staff. And I always say that this is a part of my story. It wasn't until she gave me my first job that I did not wear leggings to class. Just want to be very honest. She had a standard, and she set that standard. She had discipline, and she she showcased it, she said it, and so for me, it was like, okay, you're giving me an opportunity to be something, but I'm also surrounding myself with individuals that you are encouraging them to be something. So it was a beautiful space, and I think that that space allowed me to grow, develop, but mentor so many individuals that even still to this day, I saw one of them yesterday, and I'm like, you're still one of my babies. Because you were, you literally were my baby. And now I'm watching you literally. So it's beautiful when you're able to be like in certain spaces and put in certain people's lives that you really just don't know why. But you are given opportunities to really showcase who you are. And, just, and so transitioning from Prairie View, Dr. Bradford really did that. She kept me on. I started with that Panther Prize Summer Bridge Program as a counselor. Hey, LYS fam. It's Ole. Thanks so much for listening to LYS. I just wanted to take a quick moment to talk to the parents. That's right, mom and dad. Parents, prepare your child for their best educational fit after high school with our comprehensive LYS Parents Guidebook. Our helpful guide includes a range of activities designed to help you better understand your child's unique gifts and abilities. Additionally, we provide valuable insights into the student loan debt crisis and offer practical tips on how to avoid accumulating large amounts of debt. Our ebook also includes a wealth of information on scholarships, grants, and payment exemptions that can help guide your child towards a bright and successful future. With our expert guidance, you can rest assured that your child is well prepared to make informed decisions about their education and career path. Don't let your child's future be in jeopardy. Invest in their future today by downloading the LYS Parents Guidebook. Simply go to lys.com forward slash parents to get your copy today. Now let's get back to the show because you know it's some good topics. I eventually went from counselor to program specialist over the course of the summers that I worked with her. I worked as a history counselor for the president of Prairie View and University at the time, Dr. George C. Wright. I did, she put me in that position. Um, so a lot of the things that I navigated at Prairie View, she was there to help me. Um, she was a mentor, of course. I, I was I was initiated there. I was initiated at Zeddingham Chapter, Spring 17. She's one of my sorors, so she's a mentor of mine. Continued on with my master's degree. And she was the one who told me, if you don't want to stay in higher, edu higher education, go pursue something else, which led me to go become a paraprofessional in K-12. I didn't like it. Guess what? That I came back into higher education as an academic advisor, and it took off from here. She wrote my letter to help me get into my doctoral program. So she really played a pivotal part into helping me become the woman that I am, which every space that I go into now, I have to hold leadership to that standard. Because of the standard that she set when I came into this space or into this industry. So it's kind of hard now to navigate certain spaces because of the precedence that she has set in terms of what it should look like as a black woman at that level. 
So if you could kind of, you know, let's say with all that experience that you've had personally and getting the mentorship, which that's a big part about just what we talk about and actually do, and and if you were to give advice to, you know, someone in the audience or to maybe some kid who's hearing this one day and you're to say, hey, listen, I think this is the best way to get your higher education, right? A formula, a strategy. Could you kind of create that formula or strategy and share it with us? Yes. What would that be? Absolutely. And I know we'll probably get into the gist of my dissertation but in my research, but it literally aligns with everything that I studied. I really encourage you, if you, wherever, what walk of life you're in, and I explain this to students on a daily day, I can't explain to you that this is what you should do, this is what you should become. These are just recommendations, <laughs> and it's up to you on whether or not you apply that and you adapt to that. But what I would recommend is that no matter what walk, what no, no matter what walk of life you're in, really figure out who you are and what you want to become. I know at if, at the younger level, you know that that's probably very cliche to say, but still, at the younger level, we still have to understand who you are as a young person and what you want to become. And then from there, we can kind of help you shape this thing however you want. But I think that if you're an adolescent, if you're, you know, small going up to middle school, I really think start to explore who you are. And like I said, I'll get into this, but you know, with my residency in my program, um, we had to kind of go into the field and do these things. And so Allen ISD is doing some wonderful things in terms of creating um, like a STEM bus. And the STEM bus is to enhance students' awareness with STEM and to kind of enhance their knowledge and get them like excited about just the wonderful world of STEM. So I would say explore your talents. You know, I just kind of shared with you that I went through all different types of crazy career, you know, interests, and that's okay. And so I highly recommend you to do that because literally it's not about how you start, it's about how you finish. So I really say explore who you are, explore what you want to become. Don't be afraid to explore, but also too, as long as you like hold yourself to that standard and what you want to become, I really, really encourage you to just hold yourself accountable because there's nothing that you can't do. No, that sounds like part of our methodology we call being known doing is the methodology. And the, the being aspect is developing your character, your values, and your principles. And so once you develop those character values and principles and you, you really understand that, you start knowing which relationships matter, right? Because like you said, there's some that maybe you're together for four or five weeks over the summer, and then there's some that are lifelong, like your mentor. And so so it's, it's really interesting that, that it's kind of touching on that same, that same point. So talk to us a little bit about your doctorate degree. It's in educational uh, leadership and ethics, correct? Yes, so it's a doctorate of education in ethical leadership. In ethical leadership. Yes. And so, and so uh, you pursued that and your dissertation was on? Yes, so my dissertation studied the academic advising perceptions of undergraduate upperclassmen black and middle STEM students looking at an HBCU setting as well as an HSI setting. Yes. Okay. Can you explain that to us who are down here? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So overall, in a gist, um, and just to kind of give you the background knowledge, I wanted to do this because I do have a background in academic advising, and that opportunity was at Brady and the University, and that was when I kind of got my start in the field. I kind of call that like my big, my big woman, big girl job when I first got into the field, and I really got frustrated. And this is crazy, but it, like uh, I go off of a quote by Shirley Chisholm that says, you don't make progress by standing on the sidelines whimpering and complaining. You make progress by going to showcase your ideas. So I really hold myself to that quote that if you are upset about something, then talk about it. And that's what I did in my research. And in my research, I basically took my personal experience, and I wasn't biased with this, but I took my personal experience based off of observations. And I'm like, you know, I sit next to this, this wonderful advisor. I'm like, I sit next to her, 
if you are working with our black males who are majoring in STEM, right, and they're coming to you and they're frustrated, I'm even frustrated listening to how you're advising them. I'm frustrated as to the, the return investment. I'm frustrated. So for me, I just kind of kept silent. And of course, my research explains my overall, I guess you can say, want to understand what's happening with this particular population and why is there a lack of preparation in terms of getting you to the field or getting you to the industry. Like, what's happening here? And one of the things that Dr. Bradford studied was, and she told us that the black man and the black male, like, they're a statistic. And I don't know what it is you need to study, but you need to find something that's going to allow their voices to be heard. And that's what I did. I had a passion for student success. I had a passion for just everything that I was doing. But I was like, it has to be something that I can say to figure this out. Um, so overall, my research focuses on black males who attended a HBCU, which is a historically black college um, and university as well as an HSI, which is a Hispanic Serving Institution. That is a commonly new term in our industry. And so you probably are familiar with an MSI, which is a Minority Serving Institution. That's kind of like the baseline, but now under the Minority Serving of Bradley, you have the breakdown of HBCUs, um, HSIs, and things like that. So that's just the basic, but when we get into the breakdown of that, you kind of got, start going into these different areas. And so in HSI is one of those areas, which is a commonly new term. And so where I work, University of Houston, is now considered an HSI institution. And so what I did was I studied the academic advising perceptions. I used a five-step theoretical framework by Terry O'Bain. And this particular framework has a five-step model. Everything that I just said about, for example, the first step of exploring your life goals. Second step, exploring your vocational goals. And then the third, the third, fourth, and fifth step are basically saying, okay, now as an academic advisor, we're exploring programs. Then we're working together to um, schedule your courses or look at courses. And then from there, we're assigning those courses. So pretty much the model says that as an academic advisor, we should be following these steps in order to be successful practitioners in our field. And so my research kind of basically states that we're not even doing the first two steps. We're going straight to step three, four, and five, where, and this is the reality, we are just saying when students come to our institutions, yeah, okay, who are you? Nice to meet you. Okay, and what do you want to major in? That's all we're doing. Yeah. My research is saying, hold on, you all. We're not even looking at one and two. And even O'Banion is saying that we need to see and understand what our student, who our students are and what they want to become before just saying, OK, you can go be an engineer. OK, well, let me understand who you are and what engineering means to you before I just say, go be an engineer. Yeah. Um, and so I'm the practitioner when you come into my office. Do you even like math? Let's talk about that. If you don't like math, then why are we even trying to put you in a particular subject that we know you're not going to be successful in? And so in my research, I had 10 lovely participants who basically said that my advisor doesn't even talk to me about who I am. They only talk to me about the courses to get me to the next semester. It's right in the research. So I, I encourage individuals to really read their, their responses and really understand the frustration that comes out because full circle moment, I'm now sitting in a seat that I'm working with students that are graduating and they're coming to me saying, oh, Dr. Hayes, I, I need a job. And so now my conversation is, okay, so in college, what did you do? Did you get an internship? Did you, what did you do to prepare yourself? So I find myself now in the field or in the work of the first two steps of my, of my dissertation. Hey, LYS fam. It's Ole once again. You know, these days, many families are busy, but want personalized attention. We at Laddering Your Success understand this dilemma and have created a unique approach to help guide you and your child with personal development tools to build a life of purpose. 
This intimate approach is helpful for those parents that feel the need to have a focused heart-to-heart -heart conversation deciding on the next steps after high school. We provide individual post-secondary planning, virtual customized college and career counseling, and scholarship guidance and planning. Our one-on-one -on -one sessions are tailored to each individual student to maximize their potential in the post-secondary realm. With our guidance, your child will be able to make their dreams a reality. Don't wait. Simply go to lys.com forward slash parents to get your copy today. Now let's get back to business on this podcast. So steps three, four, and five were at the peak of my career as an academic advisor. Now I'm at the, not the end, but steps one and two are now where I am in the circle moment. So there's a, I guess you could say in terms of my experience, I'm kind of balancing the two and I'm having fun with it because I literally, when I wrote, I got frustrated and I was just frustrated at the fact that the research and everything is saying that we're not really preparing our students. We're just kind of, hey, yeah, these are the classes. We're just taking their money. Yeah. We're just, we're just taking their money, but we're really not preparing them. So. That's that's so beautiful because it just reminds me so much of, of being able to do and you know, just you know, kudos to Pestis for coming up with that. You know, we talked about being, we talked about what are your values, what are your principles, what are your characteristics, what makes you who you are. Now let's start looking at resources, now let's start looking at how do we execute our plan uh, with excellence. And and it really goes to the point that you made. I had a chance to look at a little a little bit into your dissertation. And I was really, really excited when you mentioned real life examples and helping students find a vocation. That was so powerful to me because it, it's once again, it's a new no do, but I'm a person kind of like you, you know, and Fessus can attest to this. I was doing a little bit of everything. I was dibbling and dabbling and everything. I'm, today I want to be this, today I want to be that. And the whole time my dad's like, get your life together. You know? <laughs> and so I remember when I found my calling, and it's really sensitive because a calling is one thing, but a purpose is another thing. And those two things, you know, they, they work together in this car of life as you're driving. And so if you could just speak a little bit more to helping young people, especially from that senior to freshman, senior high school, freshman in college, helping them uh, find that real life experience, but more importantly, finding a calling. Yes. Yes, no, thank you for that. Um, and I love that. That's my favorite piece as well because I think that when students come into, when they come into my office and they share their experiences with me, so just to go back to my dissertation, it's a phenomenological study. And a phenomenological study is that you're studying the phenomenon. So you're studying the lived experience of your particular study or of your, of your participants. And so I think that's the beautiful work of being a student success advocate is that you're actually in the field and you are whatever those students show up as, that is what you are kind of privy to coaching and mentoring. So I think for me, the beautiful thing is from senior year to freshman year, I know in the state of Texas, and I mentioned this in my dissertation with House Bill 5, they have House Bill 5 and they also have the Texas endorsements. So. I don't know who's actually. Explain what those are yes. <laughs> for, for us who are down here. Yes, so with the Texas endorsements, that was something that was implemented um, at the K-12 level that when you enter into high school, you have to select an endorsement. That particular endorsement could be business, it could be liberal studies, it could be STEM, things like that. And so the students kind of hone in on that endorsement. From there, it kind of like, I guess you could say enhances their knowledge to the particular industry. So kind of see if, they, if that's what they want to do. So they can graduate with an endorsement in STEM, or they can graduate with an endorsement in business. And so as a part of my study with my demographic intake, that was a question that I asked my students or asked my participants was, did you uh, pursue an endorsement? Some said yes, some said no. But the catch was you had some that pursued something differently versus STEM which I thought was very interesting that you may have pursued public service, but now in college you are an engineer. So I think that the important thing is when you are in your senior year of high school in that transition, as I mentioned, college counselors are being pulled out. So I think that that is a huge 
a yes, a huge disservice to our, our students because they're not getting the opportunity to be able to have that bridge to guide them to the next. And I think, you know, I don't even know if they do, and I know Prairie View does this, but they have preview days. But it seems like it's more so independently up to you to get yourself there. Meaning, it's not like a, oh, the whole entire senior class is signing up to go. It's more so, oh, you want to go to Prairie View and view? Kind of have to sign up and get yourself to go. So I think for me that that's a huge disservice because I remember in school we were going on college tours and field trips and you know we were doing a lot of that and so now the students I don't think that they're getting the opportunity to even be on the campuses to see what it is like to be a college student. I think they're being left independently to put that on themselves. And I mentioned this to one of my friends, Dr. Trevor McCray, that, and I'll say this and I'll leave this, that the non-traditional student is becoming the traditional student. Mm, that's a bar. Mm -hmm. Say that See again. what I'm saying? The non-traditional student is becoming the traditional student. And the traditional student is becoming the non-traditional student. Mm. That is like our reality now, at least from what I see. Yeah. That we're seeing a huge influx of first generation college students. The first generation college students are graduating. They are breaking the barriers that, oh, you're a first generation college student, you're not gonna go for it. Oh, first generation college students are breaking the barriers. Your commuter students, we're seeing a huge influx of students commuting and really wanting to be involved. When I was in college, it was, okay, I'm just going to class and I'm going home. Now it's, I am here and can I run for like SGA for mm -hmm. You know, so the non-traditional student or the, it, it, it's beautiful to see, but we are having to kind of amp it up to, to really figure out, okay, what can we do? But I think that that bridge, that bridge is not there. Mm -hmm. And students are not getting the opportunity to really explore until they get to their freshman year. And it's becoming a challenge because by the time you get there, you're like, well, my parents have my whole life mapped out for me. Mm. So now I'm here and I see what college has to offer for me and I don't want to do what my parents have. I don't want to be a, I don't want to be a doctor or an engineer or I don't want to like you told me. I don't want to do that. And so we have to have tough conversations. Mm. As as a you know, freshman coming in, we have to have tough conversations of, okay, who are you? Like who are you and what do you want to become? And then they'll say, well, my parents. I'll say, well, and then I'll, it's a ripple effect. Who are you and what do you want to become? And then they'll say, well, my parents. No, who are you and what do you want to become? Let's break that and let's have the confidence. So, and you, you mentioned this earlier. Some of the gaps or the things that made it hard for kids to go to school, access, exposure, right? That's kind of when, when we were in. High school. When I had hair. Hey, LYS fam. It's Ole. You know, if there's one thing I love, it's something free. I'm talking free 99. Un gratis. No shipping or handling fees, no gotcha fees, nothing like that. With that being said, if you're graduating soon or thinking about college or need a nudge or help to decide, then our free ebook, 10 Things to Think About Before Going to College, has a very balanced and open-minded way of presenting your next steps. It captures broad topics in a personal way by giving students an insightful, interactive, and reflective source of inspiration. It is very beneficial to be able to visualize some of the concepts after high school and apply them directly to you. We all know life, college, and career planning decision-making choices for students can be challenging, especially as they near the completion of high school. This book will provide you with a self-paced guide to your success beyond academics and into real life. Not only is it free, you can complete this book within a week. This will definitely prepare you for long-term success. To get your free copy, simply go to lys.com forward slash students. I mentioned it was free, right? Well, if I didn't, it's free, like for real, for real. <laughs> okay, back to the podcast. <laughs> what would you say are like the biggest hurdles for kids these days? Because you already mentioned that's so powerful, the non-traditional student is a traditional student. The traditional student is a non-traditional student. So what are some of those hurdles you see 
today for like the average junior senior in high school? In high school or college? In high school, getting get, ready. Yeah, making that transition. Making that transition. Yeah. I honestly can say, and I can come now from a, I can come now from an instructional standpoint when I have that freshman coming in to take my course. I think for me, the biggest challenge is that, and no offense to anybody that's K through 12 in the room, but I just feel that there's an under preparation in our K through 12 system right now. Go deeper. You've heard some parts. And I'm just gonna be honest. I'm just gonna be honest. And the reason why I'm gonna be honest is because I was honest in my doctoral program. Mm. When we were surrounded by our colleagues who were in K through 12, and I was honest then and said, y'all are being a disservice to us as higher education professionals because when we get your students, we are now having to prepare your students. For example, as an, instru like, as an instructor, I'm now having to coach you on how to just write effectively, like an effective email. And so there's a lack of preparation in just, in terms of soft skills. There's a lack of preparation in terms of just interpersonal skills. So there are just, and, and this is maybe just one student out of that one class, but every student that comes into the course, I'm seeing that there is a lack of something because everybody is in different walks of life. But what I'm seeing with the freshman students is that depending on where you're coming from, there may be a lack of interpersonal skill preparation or competency in certain levels where I'm now having to, ooh, I'm now having to coach harder and ever on why you need to write a resume because we're now seeing some of this who have just never had one before. You know, ever. One, <laughs> one of the things that's very, very challenging there, and I'm going to kind of play teacher's advocate, is that, you know, educators, their job is to get you to pass that grade level. Yes. And so the hard part is if you can't pass this grade level, you know, it's kind of like, you know, trying to go from A to Y. You know what I mean? There's a lot of stuff in between yes. that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. And so if you could give a word of encouragement and maybe advice to how they could kind of fill that gap for those students, right? Because it's easy to say, man, this dude should have been ready when he got here. Yeah. But it's a lot more difficult to say that same student, when they were in fifth grade, didn't have clothes, food. They didn't, you know, their parents weren't showing up for them. You know, and they face a lot of challenges just to get there. And so, like, if you could give, again, word of advice, encouragement to say, hey, these are some suggestions to fill that void. For sure. And, and I'll add to that, not just teachers, but also administrators. Because yeah. I think there's a, it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship and, and there's a lot of cohesiveness that has to happen there. And, and that's something, and thank you for that question. And so even at the end of my dissertation, I gave recommendations that, you know, of course when you write your dissertation, you're like, well, we just hope that you, we just hope that you get to this point of the dissertation because we know it's long. But as it pertains to some recommendations, I really would wholly, like just highly recommend, honestly, I mean, I put this in my dissertation, that just start treating our students like people. I think that's where something that I'm seeing is just a lack of just, humanization, like just the lack of just being human, right? I kind of went into the industry when COVID happened. So life was life for just it, not even just me, but it was life for my students at the time. And it was a challenge and I just, it was, it was just crazy where you had students that were failing and you were trying to just keep them motivated. So I would honestly say, you know, and I, and I go about this every day to just approach the day with ease and give yourself grace, give the students grace, because ultimately when they come to school, that's probably the safest place. And I'm, I'm thinking of it now because of just what I see on a daily basis, that when they come into my office, this is probably the safest you've been today. So for me, I whatever I can say to you in that moment, I hope that it's impactful. If, if I may not see you ever again, I hope that whatever I say to you today is impactful. And I think that if we get back to just treating our students like basic human people, I really do think that they will start being a little bit more receptive to services, to resources, to help, to mentorship. And, and also to start 
utilizing and hearing their voices. Don't just don't just say, well, yeah, we want to listen to what you have to say. No, really take their voices in what they're saying and apply that. And like let them feel that they're valued. Let them feel that their voices are valued. We went to, we had a leadership conference at U of H and the new president of Prairie View spoke, Dr. Tamika Lagrange, and she, Tamika Lagrange, sorry. And she spoke and she mentioned that where we are now, we have a lot of work to do post COVID. And one of the things that she mentioned was that, I mean, sadly, we're living in a world where people don't want to come back to campuses or people don't want to come out of the online modality. And so I honestly would say, you know, a recommendation is just to, you know, just do your best to meet the students where they need to be. Because it's a challenge for them. Being online and everybody is just in, is in different walks of life now in 2024 versus when we were pre-COVID and post-COVID. And I just think that we got to show a little bit more of tender love and care with, with this next generation, um, which I'm okay with. But I just think that we all have to start treating each other like people. Like, and to my point, yes, we don't expect, and I tell students, I don't expect you to have to figure out. But it is a little frustrating sometimes because it's just like, man, this is basic, right? But it's not. So it kind of reminded me of a challenge I had with, I, was, I did behavior intervention, mm -hmm. and I was a young man who came into school late, and, and you know, I'm supposed to give him a truancy pass, and you know how they stack up, and then eventually your family goes to court and whatnot. So that was, that was my job. And, and, and he walked in, and I said, why are you late? And my mom didn't come home last night, and I had to iron my clothes and my siblings' clothes. And I said, go to class. I'm not kidding. Nothing. Just go and do your best in class. Mm -hmm. And even though that's technically not my call to make at that time, it's looking at him for what he's going to become. And so, riding those truancies, he could have eventually, you know, end up in the court system and things like that. But he's at least trying to make it. And when you're in fourth grade and you're doing that, okay, look, you got a long road ahead of you. Yes. And so it's really challenging. And so. Now talk to us as if we're your family, mm -hmm. and you were going to give us some advice. Um, let's say we're making that transition from, you know, wherever we're at, high school, we're juniors, we're seniors, and we're, we're about to make that leap. Uh, what advice would you give up to us as if we're your family? Ooh, hope y'all listening. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> but I would honestly say to, you know, my brother, the other cousins, whomever. I would really say, like, your your journey is your journey, and let it be your journey. Don't try to let someone tell you who you should become and what you should become. Really find out who and what you want to become for yourself, and really do that for yourself. Don't do it for someone else. And I think once you start to walk in your purpose, and once things start to be revealed to you in terms of like where you should be. I really do think that you should kind of maybe lean into that. Also, most importantly, ooh, have your faith because honestly, you know, I honestly am not where I am today without my faith because it's an everyday praying situation of just a matter of like, God, wherever you want me to go, that's where I want you to take me and wherever you're, whenever and wherever you're going to move me, that is up to you. And so, just any advice would be just to get ahead of the curve. Always stay knowledgeable in, in your industry. Always, if you have a LinkedIn profile, like always keep your head in the know as to what is going on in your industry. Network. I'm like a networking bird. I love going places and networking with people. I love talking to people. So if you can network wherever you can go to conferences, if you can go, of course, to, like I'm going to a week-long institute next month where I'm going to be networking with just individuals from career centers from all over the world. You know, go to these things. Put yourself in these spaces to talk to these individuals. Like, you all are here today. So do what you have to do to put yourself ahead and stay ahead. There's always something that, like, for example, with this, my team was looking at me like, oh, you want to do a podcast here? Yeah. But my former colleague was here too, and she plugged me in. So it's about networking and people knowing the good work that you're doing and helping you get into certain spaces. So I really do think that 
understanding and defining your brand and then being able to show up and and really portray who you are in that space. But most importantly, just being authentic. Be authentic with you and always just know what space you're wanting to go into and show up and be the best version of yourself. I don't think I could have said any better myself. Mm-hmm. We gotta get that and then just put that everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're just going to throw it out to the audience. We have a couple minutes. If you have a question, something that you know sparked something in your mind, if you're looking for some career advice, school advice, we have a wonderful resource here. And if you have anything for us as well, we're more than happy to, to take any questions. So open it up to the audience. So if just uh, if you have a advisor who's maybe burned out or you know doesn't necessarily care that much about you what are some ways or questions to get the most of their time when you do have it mm. wow. that's a bar and yeah. just, and my heart sunk when you was just like they don't care about you because first and foremost i, I really do feel that um in any situation no matter where you're going i really do feel like if you're if you're investing your time money and energy um, i really do think that they should be trying to help you get to wherever you're going and so i really just want to say to you um, wherever you are in this journey i'm glad you're here so that we can talk about this and so i honestly will say um and i don't know the logistics of the situation but in terms of the communication i don't know what the communication has been but if the communication is not there i'm the type of person where i would be sitting with you to say okay well it's i think it's time for us to go to management or leadership uh, oh yeah, yeah. It's time for us to take it to that point because at that point, if you're feeling, if you're a student and you're feeling like someone doesn't care about you and you're in that space, it's time for you to now go talk to someone to say, look, this is not right. I'm not feeling right about this situation, and I'm just trying to get some help. And so I really do think that if that counselor or advisor has a leader, someone who's above them, typically in certain spaces, it may be a director of of advising. And then from there, that director may report to someone at the VP level. So I would recommend maybe potentially, and maybe on your the website you can see the list of who the director is. And I would potentially request a meeting or have you know just a simple conversation to say, you know, look, unfortunately I'm not being able to receive the type of assistance that I'm receiving. Now, if you are you are my student today, okay, don't go into that meeting and not have all your everything there. Okay. Fair enough, yeah. So going into the meeting, making sure that if there's a chain of email communication, you have that. Um, whatever has been communicated, if it made you feel away, if you're able to feel confident going into that meeting. But at that point, if you're not getting the type of assistance that you need, and, you, and you're feeling like literally what you just said to me, you're feeling like they don't care about you because of whatever reason, I would take it to that point. Because at that point, it's something that needs to be addressed from, you know, from the top on down. And then at that point, if it doesn't change, then I would go back to that same person to say, all right, in this meeting that we had, these were maybe some things that we talked about that were going to change. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. You mentioned um, during your historical context piece that you didn't deserve to sit at the table with the president. Uh, to me, that kind of sounds like imposter syndrome. So. Have you dealt with imposter, imposter syndrome? And if you have, how have you dealt with that? Thank you. Yes. So, <laughs> I, I'm dealing with imposter syndrome today. And I'm, I, that's something that I deal with on a consistent basis. Mm. By being a black woman in the environment that I'm in. Oftentimes, and, and y'all see my shirt, it says, I'm a woman with a doctor, don't underestimate me. That is a statement that I, and I've never worn this shirt until today. And that is a challenge as a black woman that I'm currently facing. Where we have, we, we're in spaces, but we, we just don't feel like we belong there. Like, we just don't feel like we deserve to be there. And oftentimes it's because they don't want us there. Oftentimes they don't want us at the table. Off the time, and they really don't want me at the table because I am authentic, I am loud, I am a challenger, and I advocate for my students. Don't come to me to tell me not to do something if it is in the best benefit of my student. Or if I'm doing the work for the students, and you see that I'm doing the work for the students, then that's all that matters. 
right? It doesn't matter who I am, what I look like. It, it does not matter. As long as I am here and I'm student-driven, student-centered, that's all that matters. Um, but just, yes, I, I struggle with it. My name is Dr. Olivia Hayes, but the, some of the titles that I hold doesn't really align with Dr. Hayes. So sometimes individuals want to keep you at that level and they want to kind of treat you as like you don't deserve to have the title of being a doctor. And so oftentimes it makes it tough to do your job because of just how you're viewed and how you're treated um, in certain spaces. See, this, this, <laughs> so, so, so is it how you're viewed or how you think they view you? That, that's, that's what I want to get into. <laughs> so it's, it's how I'm viewed, and simply because when you when you look at the space and the environment that I'm in, you don't really see many of us. And and to them, that's okay. Like that's fine. But when you have an individual like me trying to get to the table, it's more so of when you can't cook, you can't get to the table being like this. You can't get to the table having a voice. And in my opinion, I have a voice. It's just a matter of maybe you don't want to hear my voice. Or in my perspective, maybe this is just not the space that my voice is to be valued. Mm -hmm. And it was something that I read that said that certain spaces that we go into are not meant for us to evolve in. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Like certain, certain environments are not meant for us to evolve in. And that's fine because there are individuals that flock to me that understand my, my truth. They understand my passion. And they understand and they really see the work that I do. And that's all that matters to me. But also what matters to me is, for example, when you have students continuously, oh my God, you did this for me. Oh my God, you, that's that's all that matters to me. So if I can change one, one student's life and you reach out to me, like for example, I had a student today. She commented on my LinkedIn post. It's an old post that she commented on. She was my first student in my first course that I taught. She messaged me, just she was just responding, and she said to me about how she's going to pursue her, her art, like art acting career or something like that. Like, and she's a very unique student. So for me, I was like, oh my God, I'm so happy for you. Because she produced her first short film when she took my course. So when she told me, she's like, I'm going to officially pursue this, I'm like, girl. So for me, I, that's hard. That's hard for me. So it's not a matter of, no, is it? It's not about me thinking. It's, I know. Because of we're too, too, we're too powerful. We're too powerful. So, like we like to say here at Ladder and Success, there are legitimate excuses for not going to college. There's no legitimate excuse for not getting an education. I want to thank Dr. Hayes for. <laughs> Please feel free to stick around, ask questions, and also enjoy the refreshments. As, as, as we enjoy said Pan-African Library. Again, thank you, said for allowing us to use this space and to be able to change lives. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Oh, you're still there? Well, thank you so much for listening to the LIS podcast.